It's really great to be back with you again this week. We have another very, very important, a very significant conversation to have found in the book of Galatians chapter 3. This is the heart and soul of the gospel itself. If you're looking for the pure, simple truth of the gospel, it is found here. Now, certainly there are many opinions about what it says, but I hope today that you will hear the word, that it will be clear and concise, that it will speak the truth of God and his plan of salvation to you, and that the result will be joy and a blessing. I want to take you for just a moment to our photograph today that Sherry has brought us. This picture that we are looking at is the west side of the Tetons. And you don't get to see the west side very often. Uh, you can see it's obviously summer, late summer, and the snow's mostly gone. But uh, those huge thunderstorms just move through in the summertime. They're so beautiful. Thank you, Sherry, for taking us on this little trip. Uh, what a lovely and beautiful place. By the way, there's beautiful wheat field right there in the foreground. Hay and alfalfa is just off to the right. Uh, everywhere you look, things are growing here in abundance. May well be one of the most beautiful places, I think, in the state of Idaho. So let's get on with our conversation, all right? Uh, Galatians, sons and daughters of God. This would be actually part one. We'll do a part two on Galatians 4 of what this means. And I want to take a moment to have you just look at the artist's rendition. Uh, you notice this, it's in the shape of the Ten Commandments. And the artist has very remarkably just put a big heart right in the middle. Why? I just simply want to say is that Jesus, quoting Leviticus and Deuteronomy, clearly stated the Ten Commandments in summary to be this. Love God with all of your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, on this hangs all of the law. All of it, not just part of it. The whole thing. So I really appreciate our artists and what they have done to, for just telling us that simple story. And I hope when we're finished with this series, that rings so profoundly true. So, the great debate. Is the pure gospel by faith alone? I have friends who tell me, no, it is not by faith alone. It's the hybrid gospel. They say, it's me, my goodness, my good works, that God meets my goodness. It is faith plus me. Then there's a third conversation in the debate that says, well, yes, it is faith, but I have to do all the works. Those are my duty. And my works, listen carefully, my works matter. So those are the simplest way of clarifying the debate over the gospel. Paul is going to address it head on, and I hope what you hear today sets you free. Because that is the intent of what the gospel should do. So my question to you would be this. What do we bring to the table in regards to the salvation of our, our personal lives? Our faith, our repentance, our duty. And I want to counter that with a second question now. So what does Christ bring to the table? What does he bring in all that he has accomplished? Here's my list. He alone meets the full demands of the law. He alone has taken the failure of all of Adam's children, that happens to be the entire human race, under the penalty of death from Eden. Remember, if you eat the fruit thereof, you will surely die. There was a death penalty for eating the fruit that Adam and Eve have blessed us with, may I say. Jesus alone, he alone, defeated our death. That would be the lake of fire death. And rose on the third day, offering eternal life. Now that's a huge amount. We'll pick some of those points up later on in our conversation over the next sessions. So listen to what the authors of scripture have had to say 
about what Jesus is and what he accomplished. So I'd like to begin with 1 John chapter 4, verse 14. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, if he's the Savior of the world and you're not, I hope that clarifies part of the issue. 1 Timothy 4.10, Paul's writing to Timothy, he writes this, For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially believers. Very clear, isn't it? Let's take a look at Acts 5, 31 and 32. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now, I have heard and I've had friends who tell me, well, you know, we have to tell people to repent. But I want you to notice even in this simple text, that repentance is a gift that is granted to Israel. It is also a gift granted to you. And what is the purpose of this gift? For you to ask for forgiveness of your sins. In verse 32, And we are witnesses of these things, and so it is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. John 4 42. We have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Now let's go to Revelation 13, verse 8. Now pay attention to the depth of the language in Revelation 13. All, that's encompassing everyone, who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the Lamb, now pay attention carefully, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The plan from before Eve took a bite of the fruit was an agreement with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would take away the sin of the world. There was a plan in effect in advance the plan wasn't an afterthought. God was already prepared with a plan to offer salvation to every man, woman, and child. So we're picking up Galatians 3, verse 6. We finished uh, 1 through 5 in our last presentation. So in verse 6, I'll read. Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's right. Understand then that those who believe are the children of Abraham. So Paul acknowledges that the promise of redemption was given to the seed of Abraham, this according to the law of Moses. Now, if Moses, I'm sorry, if Abraham believed, and out of his belief, God credited to him his righteousness, that would be God's righteousness. Righteousness is doing what is right. It's credited to him. It's written in his heart and on his mind. Then is it true if you believe? Is it true if you believe? Verse 8 in Galatians 3. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So that he would justify is in the present indicative. It is now and at all times God's one way of justification. There is no other way. It is only God who can justify. It is only God who can gift you through your belief the righteousness of his son. And that is a blessing to all nations. Isn't that an amazing blessing that is available to you? The question is, do you really believe? 
is your hope and confidence of your eternal life and your salvation in the person of Jesus Christ? Or do you want to share some of that salvation and pretend that you bring something to the table that God has to accept and recognize? You see, Scripture simply says, Abraham just simply believed. And if that's true for him, how much more true then is it for you and for me? Verse 9 of Galatians 3. So, those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So I'm going to give you my working definition of faith again. Faith is always, always an affirmative response to God. It's always a yes to God. So Abraham always had the courage to say yes to God, exercising the faith that God had given him. He was a man of faith. How's your yes to God doing? Are you in an affirmative relationship? So when you open up the word of God, you say, yes, I want this in my life. Are you having a positive, affirmative relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. How is your yes doing? It is such an important question. I cannot overstress how significant that is. Because if Abraham was a Gentile, and he it was saying yes to God by faith, and it was credited to him to write for righteousness, you understand that the gospel in all time was intended for all of humanity, Jew and Gentile. There wasn't an exclusive salvation. It was intended for every human being. Notice verse 10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now, that word cursed in Greek is the word doom. Let me just read it to you again. All who rely on observing the law are under, a, are under doom, for it is written, doomed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. In other words, if you choose to say, it's my obedience and faith in God, you are doomed. You are doomed. Because then you have to perform the law unto perfection. Can you do that? No human being has ever been able to accomplish that reality. Verse 11. Clearly, Paul writes, no one is justified before God by the law because righteousness will live by faith. Righteousness will live by your yes to God. No one is justified before God by the law. The law, in verse 12, notice Galatians 3.12, the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, Paul writes, the man who does these things will live by them. And we just read, the man who believes doing those things not based on faith, is doomed. That, that's a tough one, isn't it? Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the doom, from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Christ redeemed us. Our bondage has been paid in full. You see, the curse under which all lie who trust in the law for justification has no power. Gentile Galatians, by putting themselves under the law, were involving themselves in the curse from which Christ redeemed the Jews primarily and through them the Gentiles. 
The ransom was his own precious blood. The quote continues. Being made, having become a curse for us, having become what we were on our behalf, a curse that we might cease to be not merely a curse, but a curse, bearing the curse of the whole hum human race. He was called a curse for my sake, who does away with my curse. He became sin for us, Second Corinthians 5.21. Not sinful, but bearing the whole sin of our human race, regarded as one vast aggregate, Anathema means to set apart to God's glory, but to the person's own destruction. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Verse 14, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. You see, Abraham was a Gentile. The gospel was intended for everyone, for all to accept by faith alone, Jew and Gentile. The story has never changed. Galatians 3.15 Brothers, you could say brothers and sisters, because that word brothers is inclusive of all genders. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. In other words, it is a done deal. It is completed. No one can add to these words. No one can take away from them. Are you in a yes relationship with God? Are you in harmony with his word? Are you accepting by faith his gift of righteousness? The things that Christ has accomplished written on your heart and in your mind. It's awesome, isn't it? So verse 16 reads this. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. You see, the scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, and to your seed. I'm sorry, but, and to your seed, meaning one person. Notice how Paul interprets Genesis. That one person who is Christ. See, the promises spoken to Abraham and to his seed, singular, was referring to his, I'm sorry, to the Son of God, to the Messiah, to Christ. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, unquote, meaning one person who is Christ. Isn't that incredible? Verse 17. What I mean is this. The law intended 400 the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Verse 18. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Verse 19. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, that is Christ, to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. Verse 20. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Listen carefully now. 
Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Did you catch that? Listen to what Worsby's expository outline says in regards to this. The law convicted us of sin, but never saved us from sin. If there were a law that saved sinners, then God would have spared his son and used that law instead of the cross. The law is not contrary to God's promises. By revealing sin, the law forces the sinner to trust God's promises. You see, the law places all under sin, which means that all can be saved by grace. If God permitted even one sinner to be saved by the law, then no man could be saved by grace. All or everyone must be saved the same way. That's incredible. Verse 22. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. You see, we all share in the same kind of redemption. It is by faith alone. Never should we need to add something of ourselves. Those who do are bewitched. There are before this, in verse 23, before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. You see, the role of the law was to point us to our need of being saved. And Jesus Christ met the full demands and the full penalty of the law, and gifted us his, his eternal life and his righteousness. And that is what qualifies us for eternity. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, Paul writes, that we might be justified by faith. Wow. Isn't the gospel profoundly simple? Am I telling you that you just simply need to say yes to Jesus and accept the gift of his obedience, his righteousness, to accept the gift of his eternal life and that you are in his embrace, you are embracing his salvation. I am telling you that. Notice verse 25. Now that faith has come, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. The law has served one of its purposes. That was to point us to our need to accept salvation by faith. The other was to have it written on our hearts and on our minds that we may be free to love God and love our neighbor with Christ's love. Listen carefully. The new covenant. I will write my law upon their hearts and upon their minds. So what Christ does when he comes into your life, he brings fully his manifestation of the law as he demonstrated in a and experienced it, and he writes it on your heart as a gift to set you free to be able to do what is right. Verse 26, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That concept of the immersion into baptism, that is symbolic of you going under the water and into death, a complete surrender of your life, rising up in the newness of Christ, having clothed yourself in that new life with Christ. Baptism is a beautiful, beautiful experience because it symbolizes you rising to newness of life in Christ and living your yes to God every single day. I think that's just profound myself. I, I think it's the best news ever. Verse 28. Now what difference does it make? There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, living by faith, we see each other as the sons and daughters of God rather than by ethnicities, social standing, or gender but only in Christ. How different the church would be today if we saw each other freely. 
no ethnicity, social standings, or gender, but just someone who is in Christ. Verse 29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Say yes today. It's just profoundly simple. It is not a complicated thing at any point in time. It just is not. I, I wished, it, it just seems to me that there's no reason to ever be lost. It seems that the easiest thing in the world is to be saved. We all struggle trying to do what is right. But the life of faith is where you surrender the struggle and accept Christ into your life. And now you have that pulse. You have that outpouring of the Spirit of God, that, that still small voice says, this is the way, walk ye in it. Find that way by saying yes to Jesus today. I want to go to our closing picture. This is one of those great Idaho pictures where you just look out across hundreds and hundreds of acres in parts of southern and eastern Idaho. And right there, almost in the center, is a dozen cows or so out there just having a picnic. And you get to see that so often. Big blue sky. Just one of those great late summer pictures. I appreciate what Sherry does for us. She takes us so many wonderful places. I just want to... I want to appeal to you one more time today to just take a moment. Are you trying to do it on your own today? Would you let it go and just say yes to Jesus? That is the pure gospel. It's a beautiful thing. I hope you're blessed today. Have an awesome rest of your day. Take care now.